There is perhaps no condiment that is more quintessentially American than ketchup. It fills up entire aisles at grocery stores and adorns the tables of countless restaurants. And while a 2019 survey by Weber Grill said that sriracha hot sauce had surpassed ketchup as America's favorite condiment, ketchup would probably still win hands down if you ask the average American eight-year-old. Of course, ketchup does have its detractors, people who think it's bland or too sugary or just plain gross, and it is considered quite a faux pas to put ketchup on a Chicago-style hot dog. But despite its modern connections, ketchup wasn't invented in the United States, and for the vast majority of the history of ketchup, didn't have anything to do with tomatoes. The surprising history of the goopy red condiment deserves to be remembered. Ketchup's earliest origins take us back to Southeast Asia, and its ingredients were about as far from the condiment we know today as you can get. In the early 16th century, English traders in the East Indies came across a sauce called ketchup or kuchap, a fish sauce. The word likely has its roots in Southern Min, a language spoken by Chinese traders from the Fujian and Guangdong provinces, meaning preserved fish sauce, which would become kichap in Malay or similar words in other Southeast Asian languages. Local recipes varied, but among the earliest is recorded in a Chinese text from 544. Take the intestine, stomach, and bladder of the yellow fish, shark, and mullet, and wash them well. Mix them with a moderate amount of salt and place them in a jar. Seal tightly and incubate in the sun. It will be ready in 20 days in summer, 50 days in spring or fall, and 100 days in winter. In the next centuries, soy and bean-based sauces became dominant in China, while fish sauces were popular further south. Fish sauces proliferated throughout the region, places like Thailand, Indonesia, and along the Mekong River, which transfers through modern Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. Many recipes were centered around salted and fermented anchovies. Local sauces made of fermented fish still exist today, and in Indonesia, ketchup means sauce. It is less clear where British traders heard of the sauce. The 1732 recipe mentions Benkulu, a city in Sumatra, where the British East India Company established a presence by 1685. They might also have heard the word from southern men-speaking traders at any of their settlements. British merchant Charles Lockyer reported in his An Account of the Trade in India in 1711 of seeing huge numbers of Chinese trading ships throughout the region and that the best ketchup comes from Tonkin in northern Vietnam or China. As with many of the products England imported home, they very quickly made the product their own. One of the first things the English did from a recipe from 1736 was to add beer. The recipe calls for boiling down two gallons of strong stale beer and a half pound of anchovies, adding that the stronger and staler the beer, the better the ketchup will be. Eliza Smith's 1727 The Complete Housewife included a ketchup that had a pint of the best white wine vinegar and shallots, ginger, and mushrooms in addition to anchovies. A Jonathan Swift poem from three years later read, And for a homebred British cheer, Botargo, ketchup, and caviar. Early ketchups were made of all manner of things, such as cherries, oysters, blackberries, mushrooms, and even walnuts. For about a century, mushroom ketchups were popular in England, made by putting whole mushrooms in jars with salt. It is traditionally thin and almost black, and has been described as halfway between Worcestershire sauce and soy sauce, with, of course, undercurrents of mushroom. Ketchups of all kinds can vary significantly in consistency, from watery to the thick version more familiar to modern diners. Walnut ketchup was a favorite, of Jane Austen. About the only thing that early ketchups weren't made of was tomatoes. Tomatoes are native to Western South America and were consumed by native populations in Central and South America before contact. The word tomato comes from the Aztec word tomatol. It isn't clear who first brought the plants to Europe. Cortes may have brought them when he returned from capturing Tenochtitlan in 1521, but Columbus may have brought specimens back as early as 1493. They were described in mid-16th century Italy and Spain, but were often grown for ornamental purposes. Still, they grew well in the Mediterranean, and over the next century became staples in Mediterranean cooking. Tomato came later to Northern Europe and to England by the 1590s, but it gained something of a negative reputation. One reason is that Europeans recognized the fruit as a relative of nightshade, the fruits are themselves similar to nightshade berries, which are extremely toxic. While tomatoes are a part of the same family, they are, of course, perfectly safe for consumption. Other nightshade family foods include eggplants, bell peppers, and chili peppers. The English botanist John Gerard authored the Herbal, or General History of Plants, in 1597. And while the work is largely a translation of earlier works, Gerard's work became the most prevalent English book on botany in the 17th century. 
While Gerard knew that tomatoes were eaten in Spain and Italy, he still declared them poisonous. His views were influential enough to steer many people away, even if they didn't think they were poisonous. Another possibility lies in a reaction between tomatoes and pewter. Pewter plates often had a relatively high lead content, and when brought into contact with it, highly acidic foods like tomatoes can leach the lead, possibly causing lead poisoning. Other English herbalists were skeptical of the plant as well. The botanist John Parkinson in 1629 called them love apples and said that while they were eaten in hotter climates, the English only grew them for curiosity and the beauty of the fruit. Another botanist, John Hill, mentioned that the English sometimes ate them in soups in 1754, but also that there are persons who think them not wholesome. Tomatoes did appear as ingredients in The Art of Cookery by Hannah Glass in 1758. They were growing in the Carolinas by 1710. One of the earliest appearances of tomato ketchup was in 1801, which is credited to Sandy Addison. Another early tomato ketchup recipe appears in an English book in 1817, which still included half a pound of anchovies and was included alongside walnut, mushroom, pudding, and oyster ketchups. James Meese invented a tomato ketchup in 1812, and Thomas Jefferson's cousin Mary Randolph included a tomato recipe in her 1824 cookbook, The Virginia Housewife. In 1834, Ohio physician John Cook Bennett took a different view of tomatoes. He declared that they were a panacea that could cure diarrhea, indigestion, jaundice, rheumatism, and could even prevent cholera. Bennett was a physician, known also for creating an early medical diploma mill. He sold medical degrees for $10 in the 1820s. Bennett encouraged everyone to eat tomatoes in any form, including ketchup, as they were the most healthy material in Materia Alimentary. Bennett claimed he had visited European hospitals that recommended tomatoes to healing patients, but even if he was lying, he wasn't the first to talk about the possible medical applications for the plant. Thomas Jefferson records that his friend, Dr. James Desequeria, thought if someone ate an abundance of these apples, they would never die. Other doctors in the early 1800s said tomatoes could cure headaches and were good against bilious diseases, and later many supported Bennett's conclusions. Bennett published his beliefs widely in American newspapers. Papers even began reporting that the tomato cure was working. In 1836, Archibald Miles, a seller of patent medicines, met Bennett, and shortly after began selling Dr. Miles' compact extract of tomato pills. The pills were so popular that imitations proliferated and even instigated a tomato pill war between Miles and a competitor, Guy Phelps, in the newspapers. Eventually, readers would learn that neither pill actually contained any tomato. Ketchup recipes in the early 1800s were either made at home or sold in small batches by local farmers. This changed by 1837, when Jonas Yerkes became possibly the first person to sell ketchup in bottles, by the quart and pint. Other manufacturers followed suit, but there were some problems with producing ketchup in large enough quantities to sell commercially. Tomatoes, especially in the north, had short growing seasons that required the preservation of tomato pulp that could be used year-round. With no regulation and a careless is typical of the age, bats of stored tomato pulp became infested with mold, yeast, spores, and bacteria. Cookbook author Pierre Blot described ketchups in 1866 as filthy, decomposed, and putrid. Some producers only made ketchup as a byproduct of tomato canning, using leftover pieces of tomato they sometimes swept off the floor. The ketchup was also often cooked in copper tubs, which would cause chemical reactions that made the condiment poisonous. Producers made up for these failings by filling their ketchups with preservatives like boric and salicylic acid and added coal tar to dye the yellowish stuff red. An 1896 study of commercial ketchups determined that over 90% of them contained injurious ingredients. Enter Henry J. Hines. Hines formed the Hines and Noble Company with a friend in 1860, first producing horseradish in clear bottles so consumers could see the quality of the product. He would later patent his now iconic octagonal glass bottle, which had a narrow neck to prevent air contact from discoloring the product. The company grew rapidly, but went bankrupt in the aftermath of the Panic of 1873. In 1876, he formed a new company, the F&J Heinz Company, with his brother and a cousin. And one of the first products was Heinz Ketchup, first introduced with the spelling Catsup, C-A-T-S-U-P. At the time, neither spelling was standard, but as a general rule, in the 1800s, British imports used the term ketchup with a K, while domestic American brands preferred ketchup with a C. It is partially thanks to Heinz's decision to favor ketchup, K-E-T-C-H-U-P, spelling that would help it become the most prevalent spelling today. His ketchup was different from the get-go. While it did include some of the same preservatives and coal tar, Heinz had a goal of creating a consistent and quality product, and his use of elm bark helped to stabilize the product. 
His is also thicker than most ketchups of the time, and he took some inspiration from German ketchups, which combine sugar and vinegar to emphasize a sweet and sour mix of flavors. Modern ketchup increases its thickness by the addition of products like xanthan gum. Heinz says the ketchup must flow no faster than 0 .028 miles per hour. Heinz was also remarkably kind to his workers, offering insurance, dining rooms, gymnasiums, and even an on-site manicurist. He opened his factory to public tours to tout its cleanliness. He felt that these aims would help public trust and ultimately benefit the business. At the turn of the century, Heinz saw opportunity in the numerous poor quality ketchups on the market if he could create a preservative-free ketchup, a product he gave to his chief food scientist, G.F. Mason. Mason's solution not only revolutionized the safety of ketchup, but the taste as well. His stable combination contained vinegar, sugar, and salt. The increased vinegar helped to protect the tomato from spoilage, and the recipe gave the product a new taste. Heinz's preservative-free ketchup was on the market by 1906, when he produced 5 million bottles of the stuff. The recipe had a downside, though, and made his ketchup 10 or 20 cents more expensive than his competitors. This, coupled with his desire to market Heinz as a leader in safe food manufacturing, led him to be a leader in support of the Food and Drug Act. Heinz's son Howard argued to President Roosevelt that though the regulation might cost companies money, it would inspire confidence in commercially prepared foods. The passage of the act and success of the Heinz Company seems to have vindicated his strategy. Heinz ketchup has a 60% market share in the U.S. and greater in the U.K. For Americans, ketchup is almost an institution, an integral part of Fourth of July cookouts, partner to classic American foods and available freely in little packets at fast food restaurants. The military spent billions on ketchup to keep soldiers in the red stuff, which has come in handy for the sometimes less than appetizing meals that they have had to eat. Ketchup has even been to space. Perhaps no place symbolizes Americans' relationship with ketchup better than the world's largest ketchup bottle, a unique painted water tower built in 1949 next to a now-defunct ketchup bottling plant outside of Collinsville, Illinois. Despite its close relationship with Americans, tomato ketchup is enjoyed throughout the world, and the U.S. doesn't even necessarily eat the most per capita. In 2013, the U.S. was tied for fifth, behind the U.K., Sweden, Norway, Finland, and Canada. In Canada, Heinz bottles even had a recipe for ketchup cake on the back, which can only hope tastes better than it sounds. Of course, modern ketchup has a lot to owe to its history, but also a lot to Heinz, who helped establish the standard both for its flavor and its consistency. Ketchup is actually a non-Newtonian fluid, which means that its viscosity is variable based on applied force, and it has a unique shear thinning property to it, and that means when you hit the ketchup bottle, you actually reduce the viscosity of the ketchup, allowing it to flow more freely from the bottle, although that is, of course, an imperfect art. There is some disagreement over the best way to get ketchup out of the bottle, but Heinz himself suggested that you hit in the middle of the bottle right as the bottle begins to thin on the spot that said 57. And as to that 57, well, Heinz just made up that number because he thought it was catchy and lucky. It was inspired by an ad he saw for a shoe company that said they had 21 styles of shoes. But when he came up with the Heinz 57 brand, Heinz was already producing more than 60 products. Despite its pedestrian reputation, ketchup has a long history and still has a worldwide following, and it can be expected to continue to add flavor to the human experience well into the future. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long, and if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.